Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to look at the internal anatomy of the eye. and We're actually looking at a superior view right here. So just to give you an understanding of what we're looking at, this is the eyeball. It's been removed, and you're basically looking at it from the top, and they've kind of cut it with a transverse plane, taken the top half off, and so you're actually looking down at this from above. And this is actually the right eye, and the way you would actually know it's the right eye, since you're looking from the top, is the optic nerve does not actually go directly back. Notice the optic nerve will actually kind of go medially, and if you kind of rotate your head a little bit to look at this, this would actually have to run medially, and it would run toward the center of the body, which makes this the right eye. But here we're going to be looking at the internal anatomy and just a little bit of external. Now the eye as a whole is divided into what we call three tunics. So what is a tunic? Well, a tunic was a fancy term that was an article of clothing, so basically a layer. And you can put multiple layers of clothes on. So each of these tunics represents a different layer of the eye. And so the most superficial of these is going to be the fibrous tunic. So that's what we're going to look at first. Now the fibrous tunic really just has two major things, the cornea and the sclera. So the sclera is just the white of the eye. Okay? Uh, most of the sclera you cannot see when the eye is still in its socket. But of course, you know, if you look really closely at somebody's eye, you'll be able to see around the periphery, you'll be able to see the white. Notice that the sclera goes all the way around the back of the eye, so the vast majority of this we cannot see in a normal individual where the eye is still in the socket. Uh, but the sclera is going, to, is going to cover about five-sixths of the total circumference of the eye if we're just looking at it in two dimensions. Okay? Um, also notice that these muscles, there's two shown here, these rectus muscles, and then of course the oblique muscles, those are extrinsic eye muscles. And notice that their insertions are all on the sclera. Uh, not that most courses will have you learn the origins and insertions of these, but they all insert on the sclera. Now in the anterior part of the eye is the cornea. The cornea is transparent and it really is just both a protective layer and a passageway for light to enter through the eye. So it has to be transparent. Now if you look at the cornea um, you'll see that it has no blood vessels in it and for really any transparent tissue it can't have blood vessels. So the cornea is avascular and so if you have damage to the cornea it's going to heal very slowly. Those two things make up the fibrous tunic. The next one we're going to look at is the vascular tunic. Now vascular means blood supply, or implies that. So the vascular tunic is going to have a blood supply to it. And there's actually more parts to this. Uh, the first one is called the choroid. This is the one that most people uh, think of when they think of the vascular tunic. The choroid is this pigmented part of the eye. Here it's colored red. Um, typically when you look at it in a model it'll almost appear as a brown maroonish color, so it's very dark. And you can see here that in the choroid there's plenty of blood vessels, both arteries and veins. And the purpose of this pigment is to absorb excess light and prevent it from penetrating and damaging deeper tissues. So obviously light's coming in through here and that pigment's actually going to protect the eye and deeper tissues. Some other things that are in the vascular tunic are the iris and the pupil. So the pupil is really just this hole right here that's created by nature of the iris. So maybe let's first talk about the iris. The iris is this colored part of the eye. Okay. Now, in addition to being colored, it has another function. It can actually open its diameter and increase its diameter right here, or it can constrict it. Okay. So if this pupil ends up being constricted, that will allow less light into the eye. And that's actually what we'd expect to have in bright conditions. Or, in contrast, the iris can uh, widen or dilate the pupil. So this hole right here will actually increase in size and that will allow more light in. And that's what we would expect to see in a dark room. And of course this can be modulated by the autonomic nervous system. So during a fight or flight response, uh, you'll actually dilate the pupil. So the iris will dilate and the pupil will actually increase in diameter to allow more light in. Um, this will actually happen if a cat gets scared. Sometimes cats they get startled by stupid stuff. Like one of our cats gets scared by bags sometimes when they just fall onto the floor. Uh, she's kind of skittish, but 
that would activate a fight or flight response. And if you look carefully in that moment, you would see her eyes dilate. That means the pupil dilates. Okay, so the iris, even in addition to being the colored part that gives people certain attributes, uh, it will also be able to dilate and constrict to change the size of the pupil. Okay. Now, there's some other things here. We have suspensory ligaments, and then we have a ciliary body. Okay? Uh, these are kind of down here, and they surround the lens. The lens is not technically part of any tunic. Uh, so let's first talk about the lens. The lens is this gelatinous structure that sits here directly behind the pupil, or the iris, I should say, and it can actually change shapes to focus light differently on the retina. Okay, We'll talk about the retina in a few minutes, but basically focus light back into the eye. Okay, And the way that the lens can actually change shape is through the action of the ciliary body. So let's zoom in a little bit right here. This thing right here is the ciliary body, and it actually exists circumferentially around the lens. We're just looking at a cross section here. These little strings right here are called suspensory ligaments, and if we look carefully, the lens is actually connected indirectly to the ciliary body via these suspensory ligaments. Okay? And so what will happen is the ciliary body can contract and relax. If it contracts, it will pull away from the lens, which will pull the suspensory bodies, in this case downward, and it will pull the lens downward and sort of elongate the lens. Or when it relaxes, it goes the opposite direction. It kind of forces it more up, and then it will kind of cause the lens to bulge inward. Okay? So this changes the shape of the lens, and collectively, the ciliary body and the suspensory ligaments can change the shape of the lens so you can focus light differently backwards. A couple other things in this area. We have what's called the anterior chamber and then something called the posterior chamber. Okay, So the anterior chamber is really everything between the cornea and the iris. Okay, So this space right here, this is a good representation of what the anterior chamber is. And it's filled with a watery substance called aqueous humor. Humor is a fancy term for just fluid, and so this is a watery fluid that's in the anterior chamber. Posterior chamber is a little bit more difficult to see, but basically the posterior chamber is everything between the iris and the lens. Okay? Um, it's a little bit difficult to see because they've kind of changed the shape of the lens so you can see everything a little bit better. But basically between the iris and the lens, that's the posterior chamber. And it is also filled with aqueous humor. Right? So let's track the flow of light through this. So light will come this direction. It will pass through the cornea. Then it will pass through the anterior chamber. And then it will pass through the pupil, which of course is made up via the iris. And then from the pupil, it'll hit the posterior chamber. And then it will hit the lens. And then from there, the light will be focused to different points on the back of the eye. So now we're looking at the back of the eye. And we've covered now all the vascular tunic. Let's now look at the nervous tunic because that's more relevant here. This yellow part, so this is the deepest layer, is called the retina. This is part of the uh, nervous tunic. The retina contains receptors for light, termed photoreceptors. And you may have heard these in different contexts. Uh, they're usually divided into rods and cones. But collectively, rods and cones are photoreceptors, and they're contained in the retina. So when I said that light's focused backwards on the retina earlier, uh, that's to get it on different regions of the retina so that the photoreceptors are able to detect that light. Okay. Now, if we follow the retina around here, we see that the retina will actually, at least the neurons of it, will exit posteriorly from the eyeball as the optic nerve. The optic nerve is also cranial nerve number two. And also along with this optic nerve, we have retinal blood vessels, arteries that supply the retina and the choroid, and we also have veins that drain that blood. Okay, So this is our optic nerve exiting backwards. Now. Uh, if you look at the inside the eye, the region where we have the optic nerve exiting, there are no photoreceptors. Okay? So just in this region right here where the optic nerve exits, there are no photoreceptors. This is something called, in slang terms, the blind spot, or in scientific terms, the optic disc. And so what the optic disc is, is it's a human's blind spot where there are no photoreceptors 
on the back of the eye in the retina. Okay. Um, now, normally, unless if you have both eyes open, you won't be able to see your blind spot because your blind spot exists only in one spot. So if you manage to look in that one spot in one eye, let's say your right eye, you can still see in your left eye. So anytime you actually hit your blind spot while you've got two eyes open, uh, your blind spot is compensated for. So when they're both open, you're not able to detect it. The only way you're able to detect your blind spot is actually by covering one eye, and it's still very difficult because it's actually a, quite a small region. Okay? If you're looking at a different view of this, what you'll actually see is that the region where the blind spot is is the region where all the blood vessels seem to originate from. So if you're looking at, a, at a, an anterior view of the eye and you see a region where there's a lot of blood vessels going toward or coming to, converging at, let's say, that's where the optic disc is. All right. Now there's another region right here called the macula lutea. Uh, this region, uh, you won't see the blood vessels there, okay? but this region is the opposite. It is the site of highest visual acuity. Okay? Uh, so the macula is right here. And you'll actually notice the macula lutea uh, is a little bit darker than the rest of the retina. Okay? And that's because it is very dense with photoreceptor cells. So this general region inside this black circle right here, that is the macula lutea. However, there's a central part of this, a central depression, right in the bullseye center of the macula lutea, and this is what's called the fovea centralis. And really, we can say that the fovea centralis, right there in the center, is really the site on the retina that has the highest density, or we could say highest concentration, of photoreceptor cells. That being said, it's the site of highest visual acuity. Now, you can actually have degeneration of these neurons in the macula lutea, and that's actually referred to as macular degeneration, or if it occurs later in life, it's usually called age-related macular degeneration. I actually had an instructor at one point who actually had this, and the way he described it was uh, you basically, when you looked in a certain direction, you saw a big black spot in the center of your visual field. And so in order to see anything, you actually had to kind of look downwards or look upwards in order to get that black spot off of whatever it is that you're looking at. And if anyone who's watching, I hope you don't, but has this or knows someone that does, you can comment. I'd like to hear about the person's experience with that unfortunate condition. But again, if you have degeneration of these neurons in the macula lutea, that's called macular degeneration. Also, this entire space in the back of the eye behind the lens, all of this is what's called the vitreous body. This is our third chamber and it's by far the largest. Now this vitreous body, or sometimes called vitreous chamber, is filled with a different kind of fluid. A fluid called vitreous humor. Again, remember humor means fluid. But this fluid differs from the aqueous humor in the front of the eye because vitreous humor is extremely gelatinous. Okay? Um, in fact, when we actually teach this in anatomy lab, we can actually take the vitreous humor out of a cow eyeball and stick a pin in it. It's so gelatinous and so solid, you can stick a pin in it. So it's actually a lot different in consistency than the aqueous humor in the front. But the vitreous humor is contained in the vitreous body. Okay, so hopefully this gave you a good understanding of internal eye anatomy. In some of the other videos where we talk about vision, uh, we're going to talk about uh, more microscopic details and how we actually transduce light into an electrical signal that our brain can interpret. So make sure to join us there. So please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.